And uh, last but not least, our final discussion for today on the topic of artificial intelligence and military. The panelists will analyze issues regarding the use of AI in military applications, highlighting the impacts and the challenges related to adversarial machine learning and also regulatory and ethical aspects. I'm happy to introduce Lindsay Shepard, Fellow of the International Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Giacomo Persi Paoli, Program Lead for Security and Technology at the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, Antonio Misiroli, NATO Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges, and Ulrike Franke, Policy Fellow at ECFR, who will moderate the panel. Ulrike, the floor is yours. Hello and good afternoon, or what time it is, wherever you are tuning in from. Uh, and a very warm welcome to this panel, which is indeed called Artificial Intelligence Called to Arms. And it's going to be the last panel of uh, this very successful European Cybersecurity Forum. So I'm very happy that you're still with us in, in such um, high numbers. As was mentioned, my name is Ulrike Franke. I'm a policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, ECFR, tuning in from London. And um, I'm really happy that we're gonna have this discussion about AI in warfare, AI in the military realm, because it seems to me that so far, this is a topic that was somewhat understudied in the European realm. Um, this is rapidly changing now, but when I started working on this two, three years ago, um, there was definitely a certain reticence that I, that I felt in Europe to, to talk about this. So I'm really glad that we have the opportunity to discuss this here today. We have an all-star panel. The names were um, just being mentioned. Um, Giacomo Persi Paoli, who is with UNIDIR, the United Nations, um, Institute for Disarmament Research, where he leads the um, security and technology team or program. Uh, we have Lindsay Shepherds at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Um, and Lindsay also has a background in uh, aerospace engineering, uh, which I think is comes in quite handy um, in, in this context. I should say that Giacomo has a context uh, in the military because he was a Navy officer with the Italian Navy. So also uh, quite, quite useful. And last but not least, Antonio Missiroli from NATO, the Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges previously with EUISS and the European Commission. Um, we're going to start with inputs from the three speakers in the order that I just outlined. Um, and then hopefully we'll have time for questions. For those of you that are just joining us now, um, there's a possibility to ask questions uh, in written form, which I think is the most the easiest. You can also raise your hand digitally and show me that you want to ask a question yourself and I can then unmute you. So um, we'll, we'll try both of these. So if you have a questions, uh, if you have a question, please let me know and, and I will try to, to get them to the speakers. But um, we only have 45 minutes. So I wanna dive right into the discussion about artificial intelligence in the military realm. How can AI be used in the military realm? What are the issues? What are ethical implications? What are different actors be it the United, uh, be it um, the European Union, uh, NATO, the US, or indeed the United Nations when it comes to arms control. What are these actors up to? Um, we're going to hear now from from the speakers. And uh, first up, we have uh, Giacomo Bassi Paoli from Unidir, who's going to um, introduce uh, the the uh, uh, the issue, or um, yeah, give us the, give us his impressions from his work at um, the United Nations Disarmament Institute. Giacomo, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Enrique. Uh, first of all, little com check. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah. Very okay. Well. Great. Uh, so thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity uh, to be here today, although remotely from from Geneva. Um, so. Uh, following the, the title of this panel, AI Called to Arms, um, I will focus my short brief on the international discussions that are happening within the UN around what in the UN context we refer to as lethal autonomous uh, weapon systems. Uh, however, uh, it should be noted that potential military applications of AI are way broader than weapon systems themselves. 
In fact, if we look at the technology maturity today, one could argue that it is in the non-weapon category that AI could really represent uh, a game changer compared to current military practices, at least in the shorter term. Some examples of these applications include uh, logistics, operation and uh, mission planning, and other decision-making processes that require processing and analysis of large amounts of, of data. Now, we, I know we will hear more about some of these applications later today, so I will, I will stick to the brief and go back to little autonomous uh, weapon systems. Within the UN uh, or at, at the UN level, these systems are discussed in the context of uh, the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, the CCW, since uh, 2014. Um, why is this important? This is important to keep in mind um, as it gives us a clear indication of how such discussions are framed. The CCW uh, focuses on um, weapons which may be deemed to be either excessively curious or having discriminatory effects. So the convention approaches weapon systems, including autonomous ones, from a humanitarian perspective. And this is important to keep in mind when thinking about how is the UN uh, debating uh, around this issue. Now, for the first three years, uh, these meetings on, on laws, lethal autonomous weapon system, were held informally at the expert level. And it was only in 2016 uh, that uh, open ended uh, uh, group of governmental experts uh, was created to really analyze uh, emerging technologies in the area of laws. And this group uh, has been meeting regularly since then to advance discussions on, on this field. Now, like many, if not all, um, multilateral negotiations, uh, progress has been slower than many uh, would have hoped for, uh, a level of frustration in certain communities. However, it should be uh, highlighted how it is important that uh, how maintaining the discussion within a UN process is one of the very few ways available to ensure that all key national players are involved in the discussion. Likely, you know, if you were to take these discussions outside of the UN, you could probably proceed at a faster pace in achieving some sort of consensus on a position, whichever it is your perspective, but it is likely that by moving outside, you will lose along the way some key players that it is important to maintain involved. Now, the, the great difference between uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems and other weapon systems that are being discussed in the context of the CCW, for example, booby traps or incendiary weapons, um, is that laws are not yet mature enough to be fully integrated into a military capability. So we don't see lethal autonomous weapon systems now being fully integrated and deployed in, in, in military operations. So the, the GGE, the Group of Governmental Experts on Laws, has been mandated to come up by 2021 with some sort of normative or operational framework, elements of it, for a technology that no one has really seen deployed or that is being fully integrated. Well, there is all of uncertainty, and this uncertainty is uh, further fueled by a good degree of hype, I would say. So I don't know, you know, for those of you who might be familiar with the Gartner hype cycle for, for technologies, uh, while different military AI applications might be at different levels of maturity, my feeling is that we're still climbing the peak of inflated expectations around what can and cannot be achieved with AI. With a lot of emphasis being put on the potential that AI represents rather than on concrete military capabilities that are currently being, being developed. And we can, you know, we can dig deeper if you want in what is the difference between having a technology and having a military capability. It's are two very different things. Some projects will, and will fail, uh, others will succeed. And only after this has happened multiple times, then, you know, the optimal use of AI in the military context will, will naturally emerge. Now, in this rapidly evolving landscape, the UN is trying very hard to be proactive and, and not reactive. So, all member states 
uh, agreed when it comes to uh, lethal, autonomous, lethal autonomous weapon system. But as of uh, November last year, the state parties to the, uh, to the CCW have endorsed 11 guiding principles. Now, these are available online, so I'm not going to read the entire list, but they do touch some very important aspects. For example, uh, principles uh, state very clearly that international humanitarian law continues to apply fully to all weapons, including autonomous ones. That human responsibility for decisions cannot be transferred to machines. So ultimately, accountability remains to people and humans. That the human-machine interaction has to be designed in a way and implemented in a way that throughout all the life cycle of a weapon, uh, it is in compliance with applicable international law. And international law is a recurring theme given the nature of the CCW because it includes, you know, it touches on um, issues like uh, legal reviews. So reviews that have to be, uh, have to take place at the development, acquisition, adoption, or deployment of any new weapon means or, or method of warfare to make sure that uh, they are uh, compliant with international law. Some of the principles are also touching the issues uh, such as taking into account uh, physical and uh, um, non-physical safeguards, including cybersecurity of these, of these uh, systems. And this is, uh, uh, you know, primarily, but not exclusively, uh, meant to, to protect the systems from the risk of being acquired by terrorist groups or uh, incurring other forms of, of proliferation and, and misuse. So there's a, quite a wide range of uh, issues that these principles are, uh, are being, uh, uh, are kind of, in a way, encapsulating. And it's really, uh, uh, it's been, you know, the result of uh, uh, quite extensive negotiations that took place in, in, in the recent past. One of the key issues that I think it, it's included in here is that, you know, all the, uh, uh, you know, in crafting potential policy measures, it is important that any measure or initiative that is taken in the context uh, of little autonomous weapon system does not hamper progress or access to uh, peaceful or non-military uses of uh, intelligent autonomous technologies. This is you know, clearly a dual use element and it is important that this dual use nature of AI was reflected in even in the context of discussions around autonomous weapon systems. So just to wrap up, why these principles are very general and uh, they do provide a very important foundation uh, to advance discussions even further in 2020 and in 2021. So uh, concluding remarks, trust, trust the system, trust in a mechanism like the, or some of the challenges that this technology could bring from uh, uh, international and multilateral perspective. And uh, uh, we as, uh, as Unidir are uh, supporting this, these discussions through, through our research and in particularly in, you know, the focus for this year is gonna be on one element of the work that the GGE is, has to deal with, which is the concept of meaningful human control. So what does it mean to exercise meaningful human control on autonomous weapon systems? Meaningful human control of what? At what stages? And how can that be uh, uh, really unpacked and further analyzed? Is the ultimate decision of using uh, force only the moment where a weapon is deployed or a trigger is pulled, or are there decisions that happen before that point that can be considered as meaningful human control? So these are some of the open questions that we're grappling with within our community here in Geneva. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giacomo. Um, thanks very much for this overview of the debate at, at CCW at this conventional, certain conventional weapons that is currently taking place um, on lethal autonomous weapon systems or laws. And I actually find it really fitting that we start this panel with lethal autonomous weapon systems, because this is really where, at least this is my perceptions, 
perception, the debate on AI and warfare has started. Um, it's interesting because in a way, this is the most extreme case using AI in in warfare, um, uh, using AI in, in a kind of combat role and, and giving using AI to give weapons more autonomy. But this is um, really the issue that is mostly captured um, public interest. And so and so I think it's very good that we had this 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 these insights from you and this overview. Um, and I also particularly liked your point about inflated expectations. And I think this is something that's going to come up in, in several of the, the remarks here today, that um, there's a lot of talk of what AI could be doing on the battlefield, but there is a big difference between what it actually is doing at the moment and how long it's going to take before um, this technology is, is mature. And um, we're now going to turn to May I say the US view? Um, so, so Lindsay Shepard um, from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, in uh, Washington, DC, uh, is gonna talk a bit more about the how, how the United States is approaching this, this issue or question of using artificial intelligence in warfare. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, she will indeed also talk about non-combat uses of AI, which are very important, but tend to be understudied in the in the public debate because people tend to be more interested in a terminator than in preventive maintenance or, or things like that um, but over to you lindsay thank you so much um I, I very much appreciated um the the framing remarks i think that gives us a, a very nice jumping off point um, so just a, a brief overview, I'm going to focus primarily on um, the U.S. approach, how the U.S., uh, uh, from the particularly the standpoint of the Defense Department, is approaching artificial intelligence, articulating its use, and what policies and guidance is being set out, um, as well as kind of highlight a few of the big challenges that uh, face the Department of Defense in actually operationalizing um, an artificial intelligent capability. So I think it's incredibly um, uh, great timing uh, that the opening remarks um, talked about one specific application, lethal autonomous weapons, um, but very much articulated that, that that is not the only application of artificial intelligence, that it is in fact a very specific um, it is mm -hmm. one of the and So that's a, an interesting phenomenon have these conversations on artificial intelligence because it is often used as a um, it's an umbrella term um, that people will use it in many different ways interchangeably to mean a variety of different things um, so traditionally as a discipline of computer science artificial intelligence really lumps together six different um, uh, disciplines of computer science so we have uh, machine learning so these are algorithms or uh, statistical models that will perform a specific task without being given an explicit instruction. So they rely on um, patterns and inference instead of a specific if then statement. We have computer vision, uh, the ways in which um, computers can then recognize objects or identify objects and classify objects in either still imagery or in video imagery. Um, natural language processing, so the ways by which uh, computers can can actually process and understand, if you if you want to, you know, um, humanize it to understand human language, spoken, uh, written language. Um, there are uh, knowledge representation and automated reasoning, so the ways by which you store knowledge in a computer, um, as well as uh, robotics and um, uh, and unmanned systems. And so these are really lumped together as a uh, discipline, disciplines of study. Uh, we often use artificial intelligence to mean um, the various use cases or applications of artificial intelligence. Uh, lethal autonomous weapons is one example where this is a very uh, narrow use case of AI, but often we say AI when we mean lethal autonomous weapons and vice versa. Facial recognition is another great example that you can look to in the press. Um, where often people will say, you know, the AI is, is monitoring or surveilling, but what they're really talking about is some type of computer vision capability. So recognizing imagery in um, some type of a video feed or data feed, machine learning to improve upon that performance. Um, but really, you know, it's kind of being able to disaggregate and, and look down at that lower level. 
Uh, and then as, as Giacomo noted also, um, and, and also with respect to uh, concepts like artificial general intelligence, we often use AI to refer to capabilities that don't exist yet. So fictional or science fiction capabilities that maybe uh, we see coming down the road, so they could be here sooner than we'd like, um, or with respect to artificial general intelligence are you know, quite far off and quite theoretical. So it's important to remember that when we're having these conversations, particularly in the context of the Defense Department, um, we are often referring to some type of capability that leverages machine learning with either data analytics or computer vision or natural language processing or robotics, but we're really talking about the uh, capability gain that you get from machine learning. So interestingly enough, historically, the Department of Defense um, has used AI for decades. Uh, we would not call any of those systems AI today. Uh, they would look quite simplistic and, and quite, um, uh, uh, quite basic to us. But um, back in you know, the 80s and the 70s, uh, we would call expert systems, uh, we would call that artificial intelligence, a rules-based system that replicates some type of uh, task in a computer. Um, so many, much of the conversation that it, it's actually quite interesting, much of the conversation that is happening in defense circles surrounding uh, machine learning based systems, we were having these conversations in the 80s around expert based systems. But a lot of the excitement um, over AI today really focuses on um, a few a few trends that we actually see through um, various other kind of new technologies that are being considered. Um, so one, it is very software driven. Uh, so that means it is uh, more accessible to a wider range of people um, as we see trends like the democratization of software. So the increased availability or ease of access of software. Um, it's relatively data intensive compared to previous systems, um, but considerably it is low cost, easy to access. Uh, and then from a security or defense perspective, um, it is very dual use. So it's, uh, we're struggling and having conversations around what does it mean to have a technology that is not necessarily just for a defense purpose. Um, so the Department of Defense has actually been uh, more forward leaning on um, establishing its organizations on AI, operationalizing AI, and also being very, uh, as much as it can, forthcoming um, with the general public. So since 2018, um, the DOD established the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center under the Defense Department's uh, Chief Information Officer, um, or the JAKE is the, the Joint AI Center. And so this is the organization within the DOD that is tasked with operationalizing or bringing to the department and the armed services an AI capability. Uh, it is also the organization within the de Defense Department that focuses on uh, international partnerships, um, international research collaborations, and working with um, defense counter counterparts uh, globally. Uh, the DOD also put out its artificial intelligence strategy at kind of that high level. And then um, the services, particularly the Air Force and the Army, have put out their um, annexes to that strategy. So they're their supplementary documents that say, you know, we see this Department of Defense strategy this is how we are gonna take AI and then use it for our services, for example, in the case of the Air Force. Um, so we're starting to see uh, where um, the armed services in the United States and, and the DOD are focusing on AI and, and uh, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, depending on how you come to this conversation, um, lethal autonomous weapons are not really in the conversation. Um, for the most part, uh, as, as far as I've been in, in involved in conversations, um, there's a recognition that the technology isn't mature enough. Um, it's not ready. It's not going to be ready. So let's focus on actually using this technology for something that it is good at. And those areas actually tend to be um, more mundane or what we may consider more boring aspects of the DOD's mission set. Um, that focus primarily on optimization or resource allocation. So how do I get things um, to somewhere more optimally? How do I execute tasks more efficiently? So that lends itself to the priority areas that, that the Joint AI Center has laid out. And so 
uh, doing predictive analytics or predictive maintenance to either uh, more efficiently um, get things where they need to go uh, to repair components when they fail or to actually anticipate failure uh, and then and then proactively be maintaining your equipment. Uh, this has been tested out for for ground vehicles and aircraft alike um, with with some pilot uh, projects. They're also looking at cybersecurity. Uh, so, for example, most major, um, at least commercial sector cybersecurity firms are incorporating machine learning into the software that recognizes or detects threats. Uh, the Jake is also looking at humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Uh, so one example, or, or actually two examples on this was the, the first international partnership from the Jake was actually with um, Singapore's defense technology, uh, defense science and technology agency on collaborating on hu re uh, research for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Uh, one project that has been uh, publicly released is the use of um, unmanned aerial vehicles equipped with cameras and sensors uh, that can do uh, computer vision and machine learning to actually map the progress of um, wildfires. So they call fire line mapping. And then that information is then sent back to first responders so that they have a more adequate um, or a, a more accurate and up-to-date picture of the, the situation in the fire. Um, continued use in intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, um, which is primarily looking at how do we process the volumes of either still images or um, video data, looking at um, personnel. So personnel um, either optimizing how and when you place your forces, um, how you put people in the right jobs. It's a big data problem. Um, and then finally, looking at uh, robotic and unmanned assistance. So the, uh, there is an example of the Loyal Ring Wingman Program in the Air Force, which looks at having an unmanned aerial vehicle that will support a manned aircraft. Um, a similar concept is being developed by the Navy called the Sea Hunter, uh, and then a, a variety of um, other kind of smaller vehicles. But I think the unifying theme there is really that this is an approach that emphasizes a human machine approach, a human machine teaming. So looking at how can I use artificial intelligence to actually augment or support um, the human operator and help them do their job better. So when we're thinking about, so how should the, you know, how is the United States or the Department of Defense beyond these application areas thinking about how do we approach this capability? How do we operationalize it? Um, and they're really taking, I, I think, the, what is the correct approach, but looking throughout the, the ecosystem um, of artificial intelligence. So similar to how we have uh, ecosystems in nature, you can think about the network of um, connected elements around artificial intelligence as an ecosystem. So it's more than just the technology. Um, so all of these applications are very cool to talk about, um, but they require more than just the algorithm and the data to work. Um, it requires a competent workforce um, from just developers to users to also senior leaders that decide where money gets placed and when. It requires a um, modern computing infrastructure. Um, so upgrading the computer systems, the software packages, uh, the network infrastructure, um, the computing capability available um, because many of these machine learning applications do require a significant amount of processing power. Uh, and then finally, thinking about the policies and regulations that then guide how and when um, the United States uses artificial intelligence. So particularly from the standpoint of the DOD, um, and, and I certainly uh, recommend um, for folks that want to, to read further, um, to find uh, the Defense Innovation Board, uh, the DIB, is a, an advisory council, advisory board that was set up to advise the Department of Defense on particular technology topics. Uh, and they just recently released a report on um, the principled use of AI. And that included a set of five um, principles that guide the ethical use for the department. And so these principles were arrived at because they recognized, and I think they, they rightly articulated, that the use of artificial intelligence is not um, it's not a free-for-all. So the existing policies, norms, international law, um, and accepted practices, particularly on our armed conflict and war, still apply. So the law of war, concepts like proportionality and distinction very much guide how and when you can appropriately use artificial intelligence. 
um, the Department of Defense's own internal guidance um, on the law of war, as well as uh, accepted norms um, and international partnerships still very much dictate when new technology can be used. However, the DOD does recognize that there are things about AI um, that are unique. And so they uh, formally adopted five principles um, for the ethical use of AI that uh, require development and use. So not just the end use, but also these principles must be considered during the technology development phase. Um, that it must be responsible, it must be equitable, it must be traceable, it must be reliable, and it must be governable. Um, and, and as these principles have officially been adopted, now the department is starting to think about how do we implement that? How do we ensure that technology is developed appropriately, um, but also uh, applied appropriately? Um, and so that brings about a few challenges um, that, that I'll just highlight quickly because I believe I'm, I'm running out of my 10 minutes and I certainly want to get to everyone else. Um, but you know, there, there are significant capability. Um, so we're thinking about a uh, technology that is highly software intensive, um, going through a technology acquisition and procurement system that is very much um, very good at hardware, but not so much at software. Um, we're looking at new technology providers in the form of, of particularly small and medium companies that have not typically engaged with the Department of Defense. Uh, we're looking at um, how do you mature this technology from demonstration and prototype to actual full-scale use. Um, and and in, in engineering land, we call this bridging the valley of death. Um, and this is quite a significant feat for any technology, but it is one that AI must also um, cross. On the technical side, um, there are significant challenges in the um, repeatability and predictability of system performance that actually makes it quite um, immature uh, for uses in a lethal context because the traditional ways in which you do system verification and validation don't quite work for machine learning, uh, which means you can never have um, under current practice is accepted standard significant hurdles in terms of the time data needs and um, as well as evolving. Lindsay, I'm afraid we're losing you. I'm, I'm afraid, I'm afraid we will have to cut Lindsay's remarks short here because we couldn't hear the end of it. I know that she was coming to an end anyway, so really sorry about that, but hopefully we can get back to you um, in, the, in the second in the, in the questions. Um, first of all, thank you very much for kind of outlining the US, US's approach to this um, to this topic. And I think this is particularly important because all over the world, really, militaries are trying to to, to get a grip really on the issue of, of how they're using AI warfare, um, how others are doing it. And right now, at least in Europe, there is a growing focus on how to work with allies. And a lot of interesting papers have recently come out on this. And so I think the United States is particularly crucial when it comes to that, which I think is a perfect segue into NATO, into our um, last speaker, Antonio Misiroli um, from NATO, who hopefully will be able to tell us a bit more about what NATO is thinking about when it comes to AI in, in uh, the defense realm, what role NATO can play in and of itself, by itself. Um, and I think, I hope you may also want to comment a bit on the ethical um, implications that, that Lindsay raised, rightly so. She said that the United States are, are working on this and really all over all over the world, militaries and also non-military entities are trying to come up with ethical guidelines on how to use um, AI. So um, Antonio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rick, and hello, everyone. I'm really delighted to join in this conversation. But let me first just say for the sake of uh, clarity, a couple of words about 
not necessarily or not yet what NATO does or intends to do in this field, but what NATO is. And NATO is a military alliance. It is an international organization based on consensus. That is nothing happens unless all its uh, allies, 29 and as of today, 30, with the exception of North Macedonia, agree to do. Uh, and uh, it is really a very peculiar player uh, in this context. NATO is not a norm setter, unlike the UN, and NATO is not an organization that produces regulation or legislation, unlike the EU. In that respect, of course, its uh, scope is uh, uh, to some extent more limited uh, also for the, the, the conversation that we are uh, conducting here. And last but not least, and perhaps less known by the wider public, NATO hardly has armaments of its own. I mean, when we go to an operation, uh, it's our member nations who bring their armaments and their personnel, and there is just a thin layer of NATO resources, infrastructure, and people uh, who are there to coordinate that. In other words, uh, when people ask what is NATO doing in this field, well, first of all, uh, we are on a permanent standby to assist allied governments to come to the table and discuss what common commitments they might want to agree to. And the first movers, of course, are the nations and not the international secretary. So what is indeed NATO doing uh, in this domain? First of all, our approach, which is fairly recent, to be entirely honest with you, is not limited to AI as such, but addresses a broader set of technologies. And we refer to them, rightly or wrongly, as emerging and disruptive technologies. In other words, they are emerging and they are not or not always necessarily disruptive. And under this heading of EDT, emerging and disruptive technologies, I like to look at artificial intelligence and autonomous systems, but also to all those technologies that are closely related to the field of big data analytics. We are also considering the impact of other major technology areas, such as quantum technologies and space related technology. In other words, all those uh, uh, technologies that uh, are distinctive because they have been developed over the past few years and are being developed by the private sector and for the private sector. In other words, they originate from a very different context from the traditional military industrial complex where also arms control agreement uh, have been pushed for. Regarding artificial intelligence in specific, artificial intelligence is considered by us and not only by us as a general purpose technologies and predominantly a transformational technology. Nobody takes issue with the role that artificial intelligence can play and is playing already, for instance, when it comes to public health and it is predominantly looked at in, in a positive terms. But of course, its military applications may have also disruptive uh, effects. And by disruptive, we tend to say and mean uh, they can create uh, uh, asymmetric advantages for an adversary, for instance, and therefore alter their strategic stability in this domain. And they can also create for their very nature ambiguity, surprise, and lead to miscalculation, which in turn can also affect significantly the terrorist and defense and ultimate uh, strategic stability in this field. We try to look at uh, artificial intelligence also in a positive manner, however, and look at the possible application of artificial intelligence in this field. And indeed, the detection capabilities and the ability to recognize patterns uh, that artificial intelligence can provide could be very useful in this domain, for instance, in order to increase intelligence and situation awareness to provide better analysis, uh, which also can help better decision making, and not only at the tactical, but also at the strategic level. And there are also very practical applications that indeed are already fully in use in the private sector, and they regard uh, efficient logistics uh, and also predictive maintenance for equipment. And we're already using this in particular for our OWADS, uh, program that is uh, increasingly being uh, dealt with also through uh, these uh, technologies. As I said, it could also uh, improve decision making and could also help a better understand the strategic context. Uh, and in this particular respect, we, we use a language such as red picture and, and uh, blue picture. Red picture is what potential adversaries could do with this. And there is, of course, a degree of concern that is also related to the uh, a conversation that Giacomo launched earlier on on, on uh, lethal autonomous weapons about the possible use that uh, some of our adversaries could make of these technologies, especially if and insofar they may not be bound by the same 
ethical and legal principles as the West in its uh, wider uh, uh, understanding. And therefore, there is a concern about that. And you know the old principle in defense, better safe than sorry. And therefore, there is also a close look at what uh, use potential adversary could make of these technologies if and insofar they are not bound by those principles. But we also look at what we call the blueprint is what we do and we can do in this field. And we are looking in particular, and I'll finish on this point, on what could be the right procedures for an alliance like NATO with the characteristic that I explained earlier on, to be able to mobilize and put in place uh, uh, these technologies in a positive fashion and in, in, a, in the right time frame. And normally, as you know, collective procurements tend to be slow, uh, tend to be affected by long uh, procurement cycles, by slow decision making. And of course, these technologies tend to be quickly uh, uh, outdated. They develop very, very fast. And I think there is a, a, a serious concern about our collective ability to operate uh, in, in this particular context that is dominated by the private sector. And last but not least, there is a concern about ensuring interoperability among allies. There could be haves and have nots in this particular domain. And it is very important for the alliance to be able to have the have nots uh, capable of operating with the haves. Uh, and it is, of course, a challenge that doesn't exist ex exclusively in this and only in this domain, but it is particularly acute in the field of artificial intelligence. Thank you, Jose. Um, that was really interesting. Um, again, Antonio is the um, Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Sec Security Challenges at NATO. And um, I thought it was a really good point to make that um, AI is just one of the new emerging potentially disruptive technologies uh, militaries and indeed the civilian world are faced with um, at the moment. And, and this is yet another channel challenge um, because there are yet more technologies out there. And I also very much like the the, the um, saying that NATO is on permanent standby uh, when it comes to these uh, to these issues, because indeed NATO can only act um, if member states uh, can act. Now, uh, we are very quickly running out of time. I see that there are some open questions, but I think, yeah, there's one for Lindsay, who I think may um, answer this in writing. But maybe just to, to wrap up, um, I would really like to hear from, from you all what the next steps should be um, when it comes to AI in the military realm, let's say over the next year. What is the, the one thing you particularly would like to see, the improvement you would like to see? It can be anything from better communication between allies or a specific development or a better um, understanding in the general public, these kind of things, I would be very interested to, to, get, to get your sense. Um, maybe I will, we'll go the other way around. So we'll go right back to, to Antonio and then uh, uh, Lindsay and, and Giacomo to, to wrap up if that's all right. Uh, I think this is still a, a, a developing uh, field of analysis and inquiry. Um, I think that the title of your session, A Call to Arms, evokes to some extent the risk of an arms race uh, in mm -hmm. this particular domain. And uh, arms races are not inevitable. Uh, they uh, can be controlled, they can be channeled, uh, they can even be stopped to some extent. I think that in this particular case, uh, mitigation and, uh, and the limitation of a possible arms race in this field is what we should look at in the current strategic context. It is entirely possible that in particular elites uh, of the private sector in the expert field could also help us uh, frame a, a set of principles uh, that could uh, uh, contain the risks, uh, the disruptive risks that have been mentioned uh, so far and establish some taboos hmm, that could be mm -hmm. recognized by the international community in the military application of uh, artificial intelligence and also help us establish what we could call rules of the road. Hmm? They may not be codified in a, in a UN uh, treaty or uh, in, a, in an arms control treaty, but it could be recognized by all the major players in this field. And there is a specific geopolitics or artificial intelligence that has to be taken into account. A little bit like uh, rules for navigation that have been observed for centuries by all the major naval powers without ever being uh, formally codified. And I think that perhaps this, at least in the foreseeable future, is what we should do. 
All right. Well, let's see whether we can have these these uh, rules within the next 12 months. Um, hopefully. <laughs> Lindsay, um, back to you again. Sorry for cutting you off uh, earlier. Maybe there are a few points you also want to want to emphasize again, but most importantly, um, what are the next steps, the things you would like to see, let's say, over the next 12 months or so in this round? Oh, of course. And, and my apologies. My internet is very much struggling um, with, I think, everybody in the area trying to do video chat. Um, so I think in the, in the, the next 12 months, um, one of the biggest things that we're going to see tackled um, is thinking about how do we start laying that foundations for building up the workforce? Uh, so this is one of the, the few areas where I think we actually do see true arms race dynamics because there is a limited supply of talented researchers. Uh, it takes so long to actually train those researchers mm -hmm. and to get that talent in-house. Um, and we're also facing um, a huge demand global cybersecurity workers the barriers to a lot of this technology is getting the right people in the organization and then not only once you get them in the organization how do you keep them there mm -hmm. um the defense department and the artists are not great at keeping uh technical talent and in their work. Right. I'm afraid we've lost Lindsay again, but I think the the point she was making um, is really is really important okay. about the talent. Um, keeping well first of all getting enough having enough researchers um, and then keeping this this talent uh, within uh, within the military is very important um, point that can't be over overemphasized enough. Um, Giacomo, you will have the final word. So, what are what are the things you would like to see um, over the next twelve months? Thank you. And actually, I think I have three three things that I would like to see happening in the next uh, twelve months, and they kind of all build on on each other. Uh, first, I like to see within the context, of course, of the UN, which is where where I'm sitting. I would like to see uh, a more uh, in-depth discussion around uh, meaningful human control, what it means, you know, the, the, really there is the need to go a little bit more into the details because just saying we need a meaningful human control, uh, it, it's, it's time to move beyond that and add a little bit more detail. Building on that, or probably as a result of it, what I'd like to see again in the next 12 months is, is uh, the uh, acceptance by member states that uh, it's not just black and white. Right now it's a very polarized debate with uh, some countries really pushing for uh, overarching ban and others that are on the opposite view. Reality is, you know, there are many shades of gray in between mm -hmm. and really understanding uh, you know, what should really be banned versus where can the benefit, you know, what could be beneficial uh, to reduce harm to, you know, uh, that is also something I would like to see a little bit more. And last but not least, a kind of an, an enabler of the first two points is really see a more structured mechanism for uh, multi-stakeholder engagement. So private sector, we've heard everyone saying that is the driving force behind the development of these applications and technology. And right now, unless they are integrated in kind of in national delegations and speak on behalf or you know, of, their, of their country, there isn't really a, a, a systematic and structured way for the private sector, the developers, the researchers to engage in, in these discussions. So I think if, uh, if that could happen, uh, probably if we're having this debate or this discussion again in 12 months, uh, we would be in a much different place. Thank you very much to all three of you. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time and luckily we were the last panel of, uh, of this very interesting day 
anyway, so we could take um, 10 minutes or so more. But thank you very much to the three of you to, for talking about AI in the military realm, AI and warfare. I think we've, we've gotten a good impression of, of what the different issues are. Of course, we could talk about many other things, um, such as interoperability, which I think is, is very important indeed, but uh, we can do this another time. Um, and so let me close this, this final panel of the day and um, think, hand back to Barbara. Thank you very much.